Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. I want to greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on behalf of myself, Mark, and Alice, and just uh, glad you can be with us for this for this program tonight, tonight, Hi, today, whatever time you're watching it. Okay. Um, we're going to continue on, and as I talked about in our last program, the format's changed a little bit. You really need, if you're serious about this Bible study, it would really be good, in, in addition to having a Bible, which is always a good thing to bring to a Bible study, to have something to take notes, jot down scripture verses, um, if you're serious about this study. And if you're not serious about this study, well, there's a lot of junky stuff on television you can go watch, so just... Okay. The word will go forth and accomplish what the Lord wants. Amen. Does. Amen. So, but bef before we start, I'm going to ask my dear, sweet Alice yes. if she'll ask God's blessing on our yes, time together in this session. Hallelujah. Father, we do. We praise you. We thank you. And we ask you, Lord, to just guide and direct this word tonight and have it accomplish what you want it to do. We just open our hearts to you, Lord, and have you fill it with your word, your precious word. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to talk, I, we had intended, and I mentioned this in our last program, that we were going to talk about love and just didn't get to it because we did other things that the Spirit of God led us to. But I want to talk today about the love of God. Now, I've <coughs> talked about, and a couple times now, and I, I think this message is, should be getting through if you watch the program, about the importance of words and having a common understanding of the meaning of words so that we can communicate effectively with one another, right? So let's start with Christianity, because this is, again, we're seeking true biblical faith, true biblical Christianity in our own lives, okay? That's what's most important. So Christianity in a word. If you had to define Christianity in one word, what would it be? Now, I want to tell you, I asked that question when I was teaching over in Oldham, England a number of years ago. And there were a lot of answers, most of them pretty good. But I had something, I had a direction I was going and I had something in mind. And I said the word that I chose for that period was dangerous. Christianity is dangerous. It's not presented that way. Uh, and I'm not talking about ISIS or Islamic fanatics. I'm talking about God. Because true Christianity, true Christianity, requires the denial of self and death to self. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. Except it's not. <laughs> but the most important choice, I think, if you had to describe Christianity in one word, that word would have to be love. That's right. Okay. So I want us to have a clear understanding of, the, of what love means. It's not about feelings, okay? You know, back in uh, 1974, a guy named Morris Albert wrote a song called Feelings, which was a, a big hit at the time. And it was so big for, for years, it was recorded by, oh, um, gosh, dozens and dozens of very, very famous singers of the, of the time, and by bands and orchestras. Uh, that's what the world has been training us to believe, is that love is about feelings. You see, the world says, both in song and in story, in movies and television, and it says this in order to train you in the ways of the world. Let me, I'm going to give you a dictionary definition of love, what the dictionary says, right? So I went to dictionary.com, which is part of, it comes from the Random House Dictionary, you know, which is very well respected, right? And, and these are the three primary definitions they give of love. A profoundly tender, passionate affection for another person. 
a feeling of warm personal attachment or deep affection as for a parent, child, or friend. And the third is a sexual passion or desire. The first two is affection. Is that is affection a feeling? Affection is absolutely a feeling. Sure. Absolutely. Then the sec the third one is wrong. Well, it's a feeling. It's not emotional. I want to disagree with that. That could be considered lust. No, it is lust. It is lust. That's that's, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. Sexual passion or desire. But it is definitely a feeling. That's why you can't be guided by feelings. Right. That's the very reason you can't. Now, let me let me say this. All feelings are not bad. No. So when I say love, I'm, I'm saying it's, it's not a feeling. Of course it can be a feeling. But it's not based on feeling. It's based on choice. Okay? It's, it's what you choose to do. And oftentimes, when you choose it, sure you'll feel it. Okay? There's the, also the agape, well, this is what it is, agape. Um, well, yeah, we're going to the, we're, we're get into the different <coughs> words used in the Bible about love, because that's, that is important, right? Uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is, you can have strong feelings towards somebody and not love them. Your feelings may be feelings of anger. Your feelings may be feelings of hatred. Those are strong feelings. That's not love, right? But what I'm saying is, the, the first thing you need to understand is that love, it's not, it, while it can en encompass a feeling, it has to be a choice that you make. I think what people oh, we're talking, about, that, that, we're talking about God's type of love. Right. And I think people have a difficulty with that when, you, when the, on the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus said, you must love your enemies, people are looking at feelings. They, they can't feel love for that. Enemy. That's why we're doing the study. Exactly. Because we're looking for, and it's based on the Sermon on the Mount, yes. we're looking for what true Christianity is, what the true mind of Christ is, what the true acting like Christ is. What that, that is a choice. But that's, how can you love your enemy? It has to be a choice that you make. Mm -hmm. You're not going to feel love. love towards them. No. Otherwise, they wouldn't be your enemy. Exactly. If you like them, they wouldn't be your enemy. Apply those three things to love your enemy, and you wouldn't want to. That's the whole point. Yeah. So, so you boil that down to a choice. You choose to love somebody that you don't like. And people get so confused mm -hmm. because they think you have to like somebody or some, you know, to, in order to love them. You don't have to like somebody to love them. No. They don't have to be nice for you to love them. No. They don't have to be your friend for you to love them. That's, That's what we right. need to talk about. I don't want to spoil your thunder, but I'm going to go somewhere. In the true definition of the word love, there's adjectives involved. The first one is patience. Well, well yeah, but that, that is getting ahead. Right. Let's, let's, but who wants to be patient? Right. I you mean, know, that's something that you don't want to do. Right. Well, who wants to, who wants to not take into account a wrong supper. I mean, it's yeah. the whole, and Mark is basically okay. taking from what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13. And we will get into that. Maybe not in this session, but we'll get into it during our search for Christianity, I promise you. You know, I'm, I'm just reminded of a time, and I, I think I've shared this with some folks before. Um, right after Mark and Alice and I were living as missionaries in Belize, and when I had the accident where I was hit by a speeding semi truck. Mm -hmm. And after we had come back and I went to the hospital and got patched up, um, we started heading back to Belize right away. But that heading back took us, we were down in Florida. I had been in the hospital in Tampa, Florida. And we went back and I visited the church that I had started in, in uh, Central Florida in New York. No, in, or I was going to say in Orlando. I went back to Orlando. And from Orlando, we drove up to New York. And it was Christmas time. Uh, this is going back to 1989. And because it was Christmas, there were folks in from all over, not only just people from the church there in Nourishell, but families from different parts of the country had come in to celebrate Christmas. Okay. And while we were having fellowship one evening, somebody came up and wanted to play this game called Pictionary. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. It's like they, you, you pick a, you have a group of people and you pick, you know, one person picks a card. 
which may have a song title or a movie title or just something. And the idea is you have a big white easel board. with a whiteboard and the idea is to draw pictures so people can guess what, the word what, is. what you have, okay? So I'm not much of a game player in any event. Um, maybe I'm a little too serious, but I, I, I picked a card and I looked at the card and I went over to the easel or whiteboard, I don't know what we had, and I drew a cross, which drew a lot of blank stares. I mean, how do you know what I'm talking about just to draw the cross? So I think we're playing teams. Mm -hmm. So people on my team and people on the other team are saying, well, you, you put, put more up, put something else up. We're not, we're not getting it. And I stood there like an absolute dummy. And I said, I can't think of anything else to put up. I mean, and everybody's getting upset with me. I mean, you're literally getting upset with By me. By comparison. Well, because, they're, you know, put up a clue. Yeah. We're not getting it. Put up some more. And I said, I, I can't think of anything else. Well, what I had was a card that had the movie title, love The Love Story. Story. Love Story. I had a picture of a cross. I couldn't think of anything to add to that that describes Love Story. So I may not be a lot of fun, but I still say, you should have got it. <laughs> because that's what describes love, is the cross. You know, it says, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. 1 John 3.16. Is that a coincidence? That love, by the way, it's in that verse is agape love, and we'll, we'll just talk about that a little bit more. Because that, but okay, so you, you can't know love. If we know love, and we're talking about true love, we're talking about the true love that is the love of God, and we only know it because of seeing Jesus who laid down his life for us on the cross, all right? Now, that agape love is not derived from feelings. It doesn't come from feelings. It doesn't come from any natural inclination. And it's not dependent on liking somebody. It's a choice. Absolutely. All right? Jesus chose to go to that cross because he chose to be obedient to the Father. He did not feel like it. He said, if this cup could pass me, let it. But, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He hung on that cross, and he prayed a prayer on that cross. He prayed the prayer for you, for me, for the people, his own chosen people, the Jews. He also prayed that prayer for the Roman soldiers that beat him and nailed him to the cross. He prayed that prayer for all mankind, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him would have eternal life, right? Amen. John 3.16. John 3.16, 1 John 3.16. So mankind couldn't even understand love until after the cross. Let me just talk for a minute about what Alice was talking about, these different words. In the Greek, there's basically two, two words used for love in, in the New Testament. And one is agape or agapeo. And, and that's a deep, steadfast in love, it's independent of feelings, okay? And again, if you have that, you may come to have feelings. Right. Yeah. Feelings so you, can follow yeah. choice. One way, I mean, when you start to love your enemies, all of a sudden, well, they don't look so much like enemies exactly. anymore, okay? Because you, all of a sudden, your love starts to have compassion and mercy on them, like God. Because it's God's love right. that you're loving them. Right. With. And the other word is phileo. This is where we get, like, Philadelphia is a city of brotherly love. It's kind of a, a brotherly love. It is. It's based on affections and feelings. Okay? And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not the love of God that we are talking about, that Christianity is based upon. In, in the Old Testament, it's interesting because there are three words that, I, that are used as love. And one is ohab, and that's kind of like phileo in the New Testament. Ohab. Oh, ohab? Ohab, yes. And there's another, dode. Don't worry about the pronunciation. And that's like phileo, but it's deeper and, and applied typically to somebody who's close to you. Okay. okay? 
And there's another word, chesed. Okay? But that's really more about mercy and kindness than it is about what we consider love. You see, the love that we have is not the world's. And it's not dependent on a feeling. It's first and foremost a choice. The love that we, the bond servants, have is not our own, but God's. Okay? It's not a human love. It has to go, it has to transcend human love in order for you to have the power to love those who are unlovable, basically, right? But Paul wrote in, in Romans, I'm going to read Romans 5, 5. And he says, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. In other words, God, through the Holy Spirit, has poured his love into you. You have his love. You're not dependent on your human love. That love obviously comes from the Holy Spirit because Paul wrote to the Galatians in Galatians 5.22 and says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. That's the first one in that list of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, right? So you have, you have more than human love in you. You have the love that God Almighty has. It's been poured into you. Now that affects what I want to call the radius of love. Like that term? Coin. Coined a new term, huh? Well, because you know what a radius is? It's about how far out something reaches, right? Most people, well, times are changing. But at least in my day, I mean, you, you know, you're born into this world. You love your mother and your father. You love those who are close to you. And, and Jesus said, you know, even in the world, they love those who love them, right? And, and most marriages today, as they become fewer and fewer, may be based on love, but that love is an emotion and a feeling because they're getting something back from it, right? In return. That's kind of selfish love. It's when you break that radius and your love starts to reach beyond those who are closest to you. When that love goes beyond the boundaries of those you like the most, when that love goes out and expands into the places where, like Jesus said, you have to love your enemies. When your love starts to expand, that increases the radius of love. And after all, you know, I quoted a verse a minute ago. What was the radius of God's love? For God so loved the world. Who, right. Isn't there a Bible verse that says, when you were still enemies, God loved yeah, us? Absolutely. He because, first loved us. listen, don't ever get the idea that God, God doesn't hate sin. Absolutely, He does. And we're supposed to. It says that the fear of the Lord is to, for us to hate sin. Mm -hmm. Okay? And God is not tolerant of sin. He can't even look on it. But He died for the sinners. He died for me. I was a sinner. Yes. He died for you. Yeah. Trust me, you're a sinner. We are, like I said, this Bible study is for the bond servants of Christ. We are the beloved, we are the loved of God. Yes. But if he had to have liked us in order to have loved us, whoa. That's a different story. What hope would we have? <clears throat> so our love has to start to go beyond the boundaries of normal human love. Our love has to go beyond the boundaries of feelings. Our love has to start reaching out into the whole world. Love radiates outwards. God's love radiates outwards. The question is, how far in our lives is it reaching out? You know, I was reading a, a news article just the other day, a couple of days ago, about a church in Detroit that was holding classes in the church for concealed carry gun permits. I think it's very, becoming very popular. It's, be, it's very common. Well, you know, it's not just becoming. It has been, it has, it has been common yes. for a long, long time for Christians to use weapons against their enemies. Okay? Self-defense. Yeah. Oh, Annie, get your gun. All right. I want to say this, and you can write this down. 
I, and let me say this again. You, if you have comments you want to make about this, go to our Facebook page, facebook.com, in search of Christianity. Well, I welcome your comments, regardless of whether they're whatever you want to say, right? If you have to harm or kill somebody in order to defend your Christianity, no you have no Christianity to defend. Absolutely. Now, I, I know perfectly well that God has given the sword to the world, to the governors, authorities. to protect us from evildoers. That's their ministry. That's their job. It is not the job of the church. The job of the church as ambassadors, as those who have a ministry of reconciliation, is to reach out to those enemies with love. It's as simple as that. Um, you know, Jesus said, you've heard, it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Mm -hmm. That was written in law. Yes. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Matthew 5, 43 and 44. The love of God within us is first of all and most powerfully demonstrated by our willing vulnerability, like Jesus. You get that? Love makes you, true love, godly love, makes you vulnerable. Jesus said, for this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. John 10, verses 17 and 18. Jesus turned his back on self-defense. Yes. You understand that? Yes. I mean, after all, isn't it? He said, do you, or do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Matthew 26, 53. He could have called those angels of legions. And you know, if you if you don't if you know scripture, you know angels, they're not uh, okay. The, <laughs> how hard has the church that's that's a little c for centuries struggled or or worked to portray angels as like little girls in prom dresses. You see these pictures of angels, the little fairy. You know what? Angels are mighty warriors. Mighty, mighty warriors. They are incredible. How many angels went out at the time when Jerusalem was being sieged and wiped out what was 183,000 warriors, soldiers? Right? When John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, was in the temple, mm -hmm. And Gabriel confronted him, announcing the birth of, of John. Mm -hmm. and, and Zacharias doubted him. Gabriel said, I am Gabriel who stands before God. Stands in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. You don't want to mess with angels. Mm -hmm. Okay? Jesus could have called legions of angels to defend him. But he chose not to. And you know, David prayed in the Psalms that... That God was the defense of our Absolutely. life. Absolutely. Who should we dread? He's the defense okay. of our life. That boils down to true faith yes. in God, yes. who is in control. So you can say in the face of anything, if, if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. It has to come to that place. It has to come to that place where your trust in God's love for you is absolute and complete. So you fear no man. I've said this so many times in my ministry. Show me a man who fears God and I'll show you a man who fears no man. A man came to Jesus. I think it was a lawyer. No, not, these are not uh, ambulance chaser lawyers. These were lawyers who knew the law, the word, you know, the scriptures backwards and forwards. And asked Jesus, what's the foremost command? And Jesus said, the foremost is, hear, O Israel. 
The Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Mark 12, verses 29 to 31. That's what Jesus said. Who is your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? Think about the parable of the Samaritan. Mm -hmm. Notice I didn't say good Samaritan, because no man is good. That's, right. That's what the Word of God says. God doesn't call us to be good. He calls us to do good. He calls us to be holy. The good, this, this man, the Samaritan, did good, excellent, yes. by having compassion and loving and helping somebody he didn't even know That's right. who had been beaten on the road, right? So Jesus said, if you love him, Jesus answered and said, if anyone loves, that's that word agape again, right? Mm -hmm. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, yes. and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. John 14, 23. This is why it's so important that we never get disconnected from the word. Right. How are you going to keep his word if you don't know it? And more and more today, the church is becoming disconnected from the word. It boils down to, I got we're about to run out of time here. I can't believe it, it goes so fast. It, everything always goes back to humility and pride, yes. right? Paul wrote to the Philippians and said, Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, mm -hmm. intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Philippians 2, verses 2 and 3. We need to start reaching out and loving others. Regardless of what they look like, what they, what they act like, we need to love them with the love of God. Friend or foe, we need to love them. God doesn't ask you to like them. God doesn't ask you to make, make friends with them. He asks you, no, he commands you to love them. That's where the power of God is. Mm. Love never fails. Never. Love conquers all. Mm. We need to get to that place where we start loving our enemies, where we start praying for them as Jesus commanded. Let the world deal with the terrorists. You need to start praying for them. Amen. You need to think about the love that Stephen showed as he was being stoned to death in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 7, when he said, Father, do not hold this against them. And that word of love reached out and touched a young man named Saul of Tarsus, who was holding the coats of those people throwing their stones. And that was a seed that was planted in his life that bore fruit on the road to Damascus years later and changed that terrorist who was out trying to persecute the church, into somebody who turned the world upside down with the love of God. Hallelujah. You said at the beginning that you need the Bible and a notebook. 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 Yeah. notebook. You might try a concordance, too. Oh, yeah, you know, that's a really good point. Yes. Yeah. If you don't have a concordance, get one. Start. I said the words are important, the words are powerful. Start looking things up. Start, start. It says it study to show yourself approved unto God. The word Be love is a good right. word to start with. But study to show yourself. Mm. Work at this. I yes. said, last week I said, what we're, the way we're doing this now is going to require more work on your part. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, I just pray that we would have that heart to diligently seek you and the things of you that we might love even as your son Jesus loved. God bless you and goodbye. Until next time. Far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. But I love that old cross where the dearest. 
them best For a world of lost sinners